Okay, we're going to talk about how we see transitioning from perception to cognition or how we think. Seeing, perceiving, and knowing are three different phenomena. You perceive things before you even know what they are. Movement out of the corner of your eye, for example. You react before you know what it is. Vision is fast, reasoning is slow. And this is important if we want to communicate effectively with our graphics. So what do you see? Two squares, right? Big black one in front of a little gray one. Do you see the white square? It's really clear, isn't it? But it turns out that those shapes aren't there. Our brain makes sense of the shapes by filling in information that isn't actually present. Without these little Pac-Man shapes, the white square doesn't exist. Our brain makes an assumption based on what it knows about how the environment works. It reasons empty spaces don't exist. Therefore, if my eye sees nothing, I'm going to make sense of it and it fills in the blanks. And this is an evolutionary thing. It's still about filling in gaps. Evolutionarily, we needed to make sense of threats quickly. Efficiency and response speed were paramount to survive. Imagine if I suddenly chuck an eraser at you, what would happen? you'd probably flinch and catch it. Or if you're me, you'd flinch and attempt to catch it, but given my unbelievably poor hand eye coordination, it would fall on the floor. But anyway, light from the light bulbs bounce off the object and into your eye. The light is absorbed by neurons at the back of your retina and a neural signal was sent off to your brain. The signal changed over time as the eraser moved through the air. Somehow, your brain interpreted that changing array of light intensity, giving you enough information to eliminate it as a threat. You realized it wasn't a poisonous spider coming at you. You predicted the trajectory and controlled your muscles to catch it. And all of this happened in a fraction of a second, or would have if I had actually chucked an eraser at your head. Um, we are pretty amazing people. What your retina gets is not what your brain perceives. It's it's. It's something that happens on a, on a level that we are unaware of. Okay, so how does the eye work? Ob objects absorb some light and some is reflected back. That's here. Reflected photons pass through our eyes and hit cells on our retina. And then light stimulus turns into an electrical impulse that hits the brain. That's the mechanics of it in very brief. But What's going on here? Is it really that simple? No, of course not, but we'll get to that. So remember, almost half of the human brain is devoted to vision. Half. That's amazing. Okay, uh, very basically, the first step, light hits the object. The object absorbs some light and some is reflected back. Light is made of three bands of color, red, green, and blue. And when you add them together, you get white light. So simplest examples, white objects absorb very little energy and reflect back all three bands, which adds to white. Black objects absorb a lot of energy and reflect back very little, and thus black. And we'll talk more about this when we get to color. Okay, you have rods and cones in your eye. Um, the proportion is about 10 to one rods to cone. Rods, uh, there are a lot of them. They're very helpful in low light. They produce this kind of monochromatic, simple vision, kind of shades of blues and grays. The cones, on the other hand, which are very outnumbered, are there for color detection. So they only work when there's enough light. When you add light, the cones kick in, and that's where you get color. The density of rods and cones varies across your retina. They're not spread out equally. They, um, um, they have a different spatial distribution across your retina. In low light situations, things are pretty black and white. You see bluish grays. Those are the rods. When you add light, those same shapes jump out into full color. So light equals color. All right, so the fovea is the very center of your retina. And when you're looking straight ahead, it's your foveal vision. Um, it's about two degrees wide. The density of cones is greatest right at your fovea and decreases as you move away on the retina. If you ever noticed when you're out looking at stars, when you look right at them, they disappear. 
you're actually seeing them outside of your foveal vision because it's your rods that are picking them up. It's really low light. Um, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it happens to me all the time. Uh, and I always think, oh, I have a blind spot. But you don't actually have a blind spot. It's the fact that your cones need more light and they can't pick up the star. So you're seeing them with your rods, which are just outside of your foveal and parafoveal um, vision, which is straight ahead. Okay, so uh, in the periphery of your retina, the rods are more numerous than the cones, which is kind of what I just said. Straight ahead, your vision is great when there's light, but it's a very small field. The foveal vision is about two degrees wide. Anything beyond that central six degrees of your sight line is considered your peripheral vision. And I'm calling peripheral vision an illusion because even our eyes or not even, sorry, our eyes don't remain still. So we think of it as peripheral vision. But even if you try to make your eyes remain still and look straight ahead, your eyes are jerking around at really high speeds. These ocular movements are called saccade movements. And every stop that your eye makes, it's milliseconds. Those are called fixations. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's my, my message there about vision. <laughs> so this is where we start connecting vision to data visualization, right? What catches your eye? Well, guess what? It's not random. Eyes and your brain prioritize. It's a very unconscious process, but it's not random. Okay, let's talk about saccade movements briefly. What we quote unquote see is a constantly changing field of information, which we continuously update and reassemble into a big picture. Our eyes dart about gathering data, retaining static information while continuously scanning the scene and updating details that change within our fields of view. We think we look out there and see something like this image on this image here. But what our eyes are actually doing is sending small snapshots of different points. And it's not random. What our eye fixes on um, is driven by things like high contrast, movement, differences. So this is how we translate perceptual principles into, de into design principles. If you know the brain prioritizes what it pays attention to, then do the prioritizing and establish control in your graphics and visuals. So let's explore some of the tricks that our brains play um, in order to make quick and efficient sense of what we see. The term salience. Salience is the visual quality that sets an object apart from its surroundings. Use it to improve speed when reading graphs and make it easier to differentiate graphical symbols. To make something stand out, make it different, we can move beyond text size and contrast and vary the object's primary visual feature using color, size, orientation. When you know how all this works, you can also avoid using it accidentally against yourself. And so again, why? Why do we want to present data and information so it can be easily and readily recognized? A, so it reduces the time it takes to see relevant trends and to reduce your reader's cognitive load. Make it easier for them to do the work. Okay, data visualization is effective because it shifts the balance between perception and cognition to take fuller advantage of the brain's natural abilities. Seeing, which is handled by the visual cortex located at the back of your brain, is really fast and efficient. We see immediately with very little effort but thinking, which is handled primarily by the cerebral cortex in the front of the brain, is much slower and less efficient. So we want to leverage the immediate, fast abilities of our brain. And remember, half of our brain is devoted to seeing already so that we can make quick sense of things and make that cognitive load easier. Use knowledge of perception to create effective visualizations. So three basic facts we need to remember. Otherwise, we'd be completely overwhelmed by all the information around us, right? Fact one, we don't attend to everything we see. Our attention is drawn to things that contrast the norm. So encode data so that the meaningful bits stand out. Makes perfect sense. Fact two, 
Our eyes are drawn to familiar patterns. We see what we know and expect. So visualizations have to be based on how people automatically see, process, and think. Visualizations need to work in conjunction with cognitive operations that are already inherent in us. Fact three, memory plays an important role in human cognition. Working memory is very limited. Remember my example about multiplying 64 by 83 in your head? Okay, we remember the few things that we visually attend to and don't clearly see or remember things we don't focus on directly. To see some things clearly, we have to focus on it directly. So visualization serves an external aid to augment working memory. Are you paying attention to this beautiful picture of a dolphin? Look closely, pay attention. 